like the Pinyam, the program chair of Industrial Engineering and Systems Management program. And on behalf of the uh, Lorena Khan and Alan and Sonal Khan School, uh, College of Science and Engineering, uh, let me with great pleasure introduce uh, Amalia Prostanyan, who is a doctorate candidate specializing in nanoengineering at, at the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. She is a scholar of the Lewis Foundation and award winner of many international competitions uh, and an influential speaker promoting educational excellence and leadership among young, young Armenians. She is a passionate scientist working on development of next generation flexible and transparent wearable devices using recent advances in nanotechnology. And I think this is the second public event that Amalia take part. The first one was in uh, February 2017, where she was a speaker, one of the speakers in uh, open discussion universities and enterprise culture challenges and opportunities. And we hope that our ties, the ties between Amalia and College of Science and Engineering will, will be given uh, closer uh, in the near future. Please, Amalia. Thank you very much. Um, to start with, it's a great honor to have a public talk at the UA because um, during the year I've been following all the events happening here and I'm very happy that we recently have this uh, bachelor program. So we have young generation of Armenians starting excellent uh, program in Armenia. But before actually going into uh, nanotechnology, I would like to briefly tell about my story because recently I have been a lot of interest towards how I reached where I reached. So um, I want to tell you brief, um, it was around five years ago that I was exploring all the possibilities of uh, finding myself and finding actually the subject that would influence me, the subject which kind of motivate me every day to wake up and really do my best. And that I had a period of reading every subject, starting with financial mathematics to quantum mechanics, chemistry, and I was constantly looking <coughs> for ways of exploring my potential, my talent, and actually um, I was lucky during that period that I was reading the book of Stephen Hawking, Brief History of Time. And it's an amazing book and I would recommend everyone to read because it's not only presenting uh, science in very uh, adaptable way, uh, telling a lot of different concepts, but also presenting how you approach science, how you can actually uh, discipline yourself to go into something very complicated in more creative way. And uh, during that period, I was reading <coughs> another book about um, how you can actually engineer materials from scratch by uh, using the properties yet that you want and by actually kind of feeling yourself as an architect and designing new generation electronics, designing new generation materials. And that for me was very uh, powerful and very, um, very um, encouraging so that I kind of started looking for the best programs all around, uh, all around the globe. I was looking for the program from Singapore, from MIT, from Caltech, uh, and I kind of decided to go to where the program offering from Cambridge University, and the rest of the uh, thing is just the history. So that's how I started uh, going into nanotechnology world. And so far, after five years, I can say that this is the subject that um, kind of encouraging me and what by small little successes by looking for every scientist all around the world working in this multidisciplinary area is very uh, motivating and very encouraging. So today I will be talking about three different uh, sub-topics. First we will be talking about what nanotechnology is and what is actually, uh, why it is so interesting for me and the, for the rest of the people who are currently working in this area. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about nanotechnology all around us, in nature, in humans, and then the, uh, the, the remaining part I will present a little bit about my research, but only a little bit because this endless topic I can just talk the whole evening about that. So let's start.
Okay. So what nanotechnology is? So um, imagine uh, yourself as a person who can engineer pretty much everything. So the first, you, what we need to do, we need to understand how atoms are working. All the chemical and physical properties. All these defining characteristics which are keeping these electrons and neutrons protons together. And by understanding this, we can actually engineer new types of molecules. And by engineering new types of molecules, we actually can create new types of matter, which can be uh, 2D, uh, 0D, 1D, and 2D materials. And those are materials which have completely different electronic properties. By changing just uh, slightly, uh, changing the properties of the matter, you can create different properties uh, of physics and create completely different generation of electronics. And based on this, you can actually prepare new types of uh, materials, and based on these materials, you can create new generation of electronics. So these electronics can get pretty much any discipline. It can go to pharmaceutical, it can go to medical uh, drug delivery, it can go to uh, new generation uh, sensors, uh, solar energy. It can go pretty much any discipline you can think of. Basically, every time I'm giving the topic in nanotechnology, the first thing I am saying is just like, the only, your only limitation is your imagination. Basically, you can create pretty much anything basing all these new properties of the material that you are getting. So, not going toward physics and uh, chemistry, I want to um, just briefly uh, tell about why it is so enthusiastic and why it is so interesting technologically. Right now, we are in the break of science that uh, in terms of uh, semiconductor industry, in, in terms of the whole industry which is developing electronics, we are in the age that we can't actually decrease the sizes of the transistor gate and uh, because of that we can't further go f uh, uh, in terms of uh, changing um, uh, properties, making it more powerful, m making it uh, using less energy consumption. Because of this, we are in the limitation of producing new generation of electronics based on silicon industry. And the silicon industry is the main industry that has been developed during the last 50 years. So we have a lot of expertise producing this kind of amazing piece of electronics, but right now we are in the break of limitations. So why it is important to, to understand the advances in nanotechnology? Because it's in one way, it can give us new horizon of um, producing and engineering new type of electronics by using all the expertise that we understood during the last 50 years. On the other hand, we can use new technology and new properties coming from the materials that we are engineering. So why it is important scientifically, right? As we are already presented, by actually creating these two materials. We are, um, we are actually creating magnetic materials, and we are creating 2D materials and quantum dots, pretty much anything that you can uh, think of, just by thinking of what kind of material do you want to get, what properties do you want, uh, and what type of an industry it can come up to. So this is another important technique that scientifically is so important. And another part is actually understanding fundamentally how m matter is working. Because uh, one of the, in one of the books, Stephen Hawking also mentioned that right now we are in the break of understanding all, unify, uh, all theoretical and observational part of physics and create the unified theory of physics. And in order to create this unified theory of physics, it is important to understand how material is working at subatomic level and how we can actually understand all the levels up until uh, up until galaxies. So this is like one of the aspects that it is important in order if we want to at some point understand how the universe is working, all the energies and a lot of things that we are right now uncertain. This is like one of the way of understanding because everything uh, all around us, all the human organism, everything is based on nanotechnology. And by understanding all chemi chemi chemistry and physics, all around the nanotechnology we can pretty much understand everything in terms of atomic level, obviously. So, okay. I think I almost covered this by understanding all these physical chemical properties. We can engineer new type of materials. And this is what this slide will be. By the way, this very nice flowery image artificially created by uh, one of our engineers is 
completely artificially created, but it's very beautiful. This is just a de demonstrational thing. It's not really uh, for something useful in terms of um, properties. So I want to talk a little bit about right now um, nature and non-technology, but do you have questions before that? Okay, you don't have questions. Okay, so one of the like obvious examples I want to think about is just butterflies, right? So uh, we have butterflies all around us, and we know that th they have these amazing vivid um, colors. And even after butterfly dies, the colors stay for like hundred years. So like this is another phenomenon that the scientists were thinking about, like how. You, you can actually have this kind of phenomena by having an animal who, which died, you can still have these vivid images. So it appears that especially this morpho butterfly has this kind of artificially uh, created structures. These structures are somehow light filters. What light filter is like uh, by when light enters toward these structures, it transmits only the wavelength of a light specifically uh, designed for this butterfly. For, for this butterfly, it's blue. For other butterfly, depending, it can be different. So basically, it's very interesting. And by having this vivid picture and by this vivid color, this butterfly helps to kind of um, get protection because it's vivid. It kind of um, uh, gives the security. And um, by actually, by understanding how these structures work, we can actually engineer and mimic the nature. And um, I think one of the groups in, uh, I think it was around 2007, uh, in Cambridge, they mimicked the structure of the butterfly and what they did. They created these sensors, this kind of interesting structures. They can like stay for centuries, like so far, um, you, you know that all the material all around us, which have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, so all the materials around us, they have some sort of ink, uh, like mixed with the material, and that kind of gives the color. In this sort of property, uh, it, it will never lose the intensity of the color, it will never lose the uh, structural properties, so it will stay for a long, long time. And another interesting property is that which has been developed by only changing the mechanical property of the material, you can actually get different colors. And this is very interesting piece of uh, research which can be used in different disciplines. And this is again, I think 2011, uh, that the research, the research group in Cambridge has developed. And right now is actually used in a fashion industry, which is very interesting application for such of such interesting phenomena. So the second one that I want to talk about is lotus. And everyone is familiar about this interesting hydrophobic material. So I want to talk about what is hydrophobic, hydrophilic. So hydrophobic material is that it doesn't actually like when the molecules of water penetrate through the material. And by using this uh, hydrophobic um, property, you can create a, a fabric and a uh, like piece of cloth, which doesn't actually never get wet. And you can actually, based on these properties, you can create the whole industry of the material, which can never become dry, because you can actually uh, create... Um, yeah, so you can create the network of tiny fibers, tiny nanofibers. And you can actually design in a way that, for example, um, oxygen uh, particles can go penetrate, so it can actually breathe. But the molecule of the, uh, the droplets of, the, uh, of water will never go inside. In a such way, you can uh, design it that the droplets of dirt will never go inside, so your cloth will never get dirty. So you can actually <coughs> play with the structure of this network and create pretty much the properties that you want to create. And this piece of electric, uh, like piece, again, I think it's almost going toward the industry, uh, again, the fashion industry, and particularly in clothes. And the third one I want to talk about is gecko. So gecko is, has very interesting uh, property. I will go inside to a scanning electron microscope image to show, actually, so, so basically, 
we are taking the piece of the gecko leg and by putting under the microscope and by characterizing we can see that uh, it has very tiny tiny fibers connected with each other and because of these tiny fibers is kind of when it touches any type of material it has so many points of um, con co connection it kind of creates a sort of some sort of adhesion properties and because of that gecko can actually uh, go uh, in any type of material it can go to toward the sand it, towards the glass any type of material and by mimicking these properties the scientists at, uh, at the MIT created structure by a a photolithography properties they created something similar here and what they did right now these sorts of properties are um, uh, emerged to the technology of the robot which will soon go to Mars and by using this technology you can have this robot which can actually go to any type of material be it sand, be it water, anything so um, yeah, and the last thing I want to talk is about sensors. We obviously know that human eye is not the perfect optical element, but we also know that uh, it, it, it's a very interesting um, example of an optical element. So by using the nanostructures in uh, op optical eye uh, and by understanding how we can alter it, uh, we can create not this junky kind of structure material, but we can create new generation lasers and new generation sensor completely based on nanostructures um, which can improve the human eye which can um, which can uh, bring new horizons not only for vision but also sensing and uh, all this technology again are coming from understanding how the nature and working and by mim mimicking the properties of the nature and by alteration we can actually create a very interesting piece of technology. And this is the end of um, the nature part. So this is the part that I will be presenting my dissertation. If you don't, I, I think you don't have any questions. OK. So this part might be slightly complicated, but I will be happy to answer any questions um, if you have afterwards. So what I did during my uh, dissertation in Cambridge University, I was growing different type of nanomaterials. I started with quantum dots and then I went to uh, carbon-based materials. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> yes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, so I started growing graphene, uh, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, diamond-like carbon, diamond, and by slightly changing the atomic structure of the material, you can completely change the properties and uh, the industry it might go. So uh, my actually, my, uh, my love was towards graphene because uh, right now it's still considered to be the strongest material ever, um, ever found. It has amazing optical and electronic properties and by understanding how we can use it in a commercial scale. Uh, we can actually design uh, lots of uh, uh, design devices which can go in different disciplines, again, starting from sensors, from uh, next generation electronics, going to displays, uh, which will be the later discussed. So uh, my, uh, my interest was toward understanding the properties of a graphene and fundamental physics and then applications and then how it can be used towards any particular discipline so I actually took an example of how actually graphene can work with currently used, uh, industrially used uh, liquid crystal materials, all uh, chemical and physical properties uh, with these materials and how we can use and utilize these uh, materials and alter and enhance some sorts of properties to produce new generation electronics. So what we did, we created, op uh, we created like tiny pixel, which is this, this image in the right so uh, it's a completely carbon based material carbon based to uh, the structure based on graphene polymers and we used uh, uh, here uh, also thank you uh, we used a uh, uh, quantum dot that also um, for a touch screen uh, 
part which will be again later discussed. So the whole ideology was to design a piece of technology which is completely organic, carbon-based, low power consumption and biocompatible which can be used uh, as a device which can be worn during the day and the, the device which can be uh, used in a large scale, like for example, large a piece of electronics, large a piece of display. So that was the whole ideology behind my research. So the first part that what we did was actually understanding the methodology of growing these nanostructures. So the, the technology that we develop is chemical vapor deposition process during which uh, carbon decomposes and nucleates and it creates the uh, predominantly monolayer uh, structure of graphene and then this graphene is later transferred to any arbitrary substrate base material again uh, depending what type of material do you want to get and what type of property it can be transferred into polymer into quartz glass into any shape uh, uh, depending on the industry i will be happy to talk about this if someone is interested um, on um, learning more about the graphene growth. The second part, as I already mentioned, is wet etching transfer process. Again, we used many different uh, transfer methods, and this was the one that we found was the most uh, suitable towards the dis uh, display technology, electronics. Um, and this is what we get. So from the beginning, we were discussing uh, the interaction of uh, uh, this uh, liquid crystal material and graphene. So one of the, um, one of the interesting properties that we discovered during my period at Cambridge that uh, the graphene having this hexagonal structure somehow aligns this material and by enhancing this alignment material, we have another opportunity of completely fundamentally changing the structure of the LCD. So that was the one part of the research that we worked over the year in order to understanding how we can improve these properties. And the second part is obviously building the device out of it by using uh, the commercially available indium tin oxide alloy material and graphene from the other side. Guys, please take a seat. Yes, so... <coughs> So in this slide, we are characterizing how the graphene aligns liquid crystal, how we can enhance, and by using uh, different mixtures of liquid crystal and different structure of the graphene mixed with the polymer, we can enhance this alignment properties, hence having better performance from the, de from the devices. And then in this slide, what I'm trying to do is basically switch the pixel on and off again because uh, we are in an early stage, it's not white and uh, black, it's blue and black, but again by optimization and by understanding uh, how we can play with the material and how we can create a better structures, we can um, have white to black, but this is very promising result at this stage, considering that it's only around three years of research. Yes, so and here is just another example. So this is just a micro micrographs uh, switching on and off, on and off. And this is just the logo of a university. He, here is slightly blurry, here is quite completely clear, which we are doing like completely trying to switch the pixel on and off. And here we have the image under the polarizing optical microscope, cross polarizers. What cross polarizers means is like you, uh, you have only uh, light penetrating the material which is only linearly polarized. Linearly polarized means this only has one direction and by having linearly polarized light it helps us understanding the property of the material better rather than uh, randomly polarized light which is uh, coming from uh, every source of um, light. Okay, so this is the possibilities of growth of this industry. One is obviously flexible displays and everything which needs representation of data which can be presented in flexible material. It can be to solar energy, so hybrid, next generation, nanostructured based solar panels. And the third is obviously flexible electronics, another very big topic. And the beauty of this, uh, this kind of uh, technology is that you can actually print it pretty much in any material. 
having the property of the material that you want. You can print it and create it in a room to temperature. Again, uh, in this stage, we have a lot of work to do, but so far it's very promising in terms of the result that we got and in terms of the um, discipline, plus in terms of the industrial support and um, helping these technologies to grow. I think we are in a better place to pushing us toward developing this technology. And I, <coughs> yeah, and this is everything I prepared today. Thank you very much. And I will take any question if you have one. Yes, please. Uh, there are these new concepts of thre string theory. I wonder if they have some applications in nanotechnologies or not. So string theory is actually a very good question. <coughs> um, yes, it has some sort of, obviously by understanding string theory, we can understand how when an electron is confined in a potential when we can understand um, the properties better but in this stage of developing technology imagine you are we are working in a couple of level above rather than actually understanding subatomic particles but obviously it has some sort of interaction because uh, that's part of uh, understanding fundamental quantum mechanics yes you had questions did i hear you correctly at the end you said you could print it uh, any material? Yes. You mean the substrate? The, the no, any type. So right now, um, around I think six months ago, uh, there have been a couple of Nature publications uh, telling the, about the possibility of printing electronics on fabric, like any type of piece of cloth. And this, this is another tendency that electronics is going towards, uh, which is actually very interesting. But your material will be printed on Yes. So, so the the base the, the base material is anything you want anything to you you want as long as it's dielectric. Yes. So you can right now where, uh, but obviously by printing, I mean you need to prepare uh, a mixture of adhesive materials, plus graphene ink, and by using specific methodology of printing. But in theory, uh, right now we can do that even uh, in aluminium. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, two questions. Sure. First one is uh, clarification. Just uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like to understand uh, your work. Uh, you are working, if I understood correctly, on uh, issues related to the production of the graphene layers. If that is true, then the second question: uh, What is the current status? What is the advancement right now? and uh, relating cost of the graphene, let's say, I don't know, one gram or one square mm -hmm. centimeter or one square meter or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the content of your work in relation of these two things? Sure. Okay. So to start with the first question, um, my, uh, so far I've been more um, uh, focused towards uh, uh, growing the best possible graphene with the properties, having predominantly monolayer biochemical vapor deposition process, which is obviously not scalable in a commercial scale. It's quite expensive in terms of technology rather than in terms of material itself. But right now, uh, concerning with your second question, around two years, there have been a couple of commercial companies uh, offering uh, graphene, which is... Um, not as good as the material that I was growing, but uh, it can be used in a commercial scale. And they are, um, I think uh, they started from selling around uh, 1,000, a tiny bottle, and right now they are growing because they, uh, they, uh, <coughs> they, what they are doing, they're using graphene ink, which is around 60, 70% conductive compared with 97% uh, conductivity that we are getting from this material. So it is available commercially, but <coughs> We are not uh, right now uh, interested on in commercializing graphene. We want to understand more towards how we can build the piece of technology using the graphene that we are growing in our lab. Electronics. Yes, electronics. Like LCDs or screens? Not necessarily LCDs. Uh, uh, flexible transparent electronics. Uh, and towards any representation of visual data. It can be big, a big area electronics. It can be display. It can be 
solar cells, again, hybrid solar cells based on quantum dots uh, and the graphene as a conductive material. So those are the areas that we are currently working on. Okay, what, what is the relation between quantum dots, graphene, and solar cells? So that's another topic that uh, one of my colleagues is currently working on. If you want, I can recommend a couple of papers. So he's actively publishing. Yeah, of course. Sure. 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 Uh, any other questions? Yes. What do we need to have this kind of lab in our I mean, we talk about that it's pretty much uh, possible to do this kind of research. Yeah. Like to do this kind of, not only research, but like to have a lab. What, what do we need to have that? Uh, I think one of the first things uh, is understanding what do we want from the lab to have. Because, um, the way I understand it, it should be self-sustainable lab, the lab that can create, uh, has a manufacturing area, but also has an academic unit. So what do we need? I think we, have, uh, we need a very, very good team of uh, scientists, and we, we need a place, and we need to work hard. <laughs> that's all that we need. But it, it, I, that's a very good question. Is the equipment very expensive? Very Indeed, very expensive. Yeah, very expensive equipment. Right, setting up the lab, like the one that you're working on, what would be the, roughly? Roughly cost millions, I would say. Yeah. Is there any chance that this kind of technology is when uh, properly researched and ready might become much cheaper? And also, so like, after researching so much into the next year, we can obviously like a lot of research groups are working uh, towards making it cheaper and scalable because it's not uh, it, it doesn't make sense of working something which can become big and then not going towards understanding how you can make it in a larger scale so obviously yeah like printable electronics is one good example of actually going from this like uh, the whole industry of like um, producing uh, all you know all the chips which are very expensive again big big manufacturing going towards actually doing in a room temperature having uh, pretty much the same sort of transistor based uh, devices so that's a very good example of how we can do that but i think we need to right now do more research in understanding and plus with the technology based on graphene we can say the material is pretty much uh, available anywhere so we just need to understand and optimize the processing uh, to make it cheaper and scalable it's okay any other question please yes uh, so you manufacture your own graphene for your experimentation yes yes so what is the largest size that you do it and you do it if i understood uh, through cvd process yes yeah? and what is the largest size that you manufacture so the largest can can i get here no yeah so the, the largest I, I, I got was something like this, but given like I was 100% sure it's ideal. You can do it like three times bigger than this. Um, again, given the, the dimensions of your quartz and the process, like because it's, go, it's growing a quartz tube. So our quartz tube uh, that we, uh, we developed was not big enough to grow like, uh, like uh, very large pieces. But in my case, it's, this was the size is that, and like, and I was actually making tiny pixels, like one centimeter by one centimeter, and this sort of graphene would last me like three months. So it was like, in, in like prototyping level, it was, not, it was, but in terms of a large scale, I think three years ago, Samsung got one meter by one meter, with slightly less, uh, um, um, disadvantage properties, but again, good enough to go towards the display industry. So it's really depending on your lab, uh, um, I would say, what, what, you, what um, equipment do you have? Uniformity of the CVD process or what? It's 
the size of the process that matters? What is that? A lot of properties. First, uh, the, the, the mor morphology of the foil itself that you are growing. In my case, I was growing in a copper, iron, cobalt, depending on the morphology, de depending on the crystallography of the material. The graphene which has been grown on the top can be completely different. So you have to have substrate to grow Of, on. of course. You, you cannot uh, uh, have a, just a layer, a film. You cannot no, it's, it's one, one atom thick material. It's like almost, uh, you, like it's very even differ difficult to, to differentiate with the naked eye because it's com almost transparent. It has 3% absorption. So you have to grow on some sort of dielectric. Or if it is not dielectric, it should be removed, right? So in my case, uh, it was um, depending, again, on the properties of the m m uh, material that you are growing, like cobalt iron. In one case, in nickel, for example, it is precipitation process. In, in the other material, it can be catalytic process, and again, depending uh, the how uh, you know solubility of carbon of the material, uh, the material itself, the graphene, is grown completely differently. So the first, uh, an, uh, another important aspect to understand actually the properties of uh, the substrate material itself. And again, the second part was the transfer process during which you can easily damage the graphene, you can actually uh, like introduce um, dust particles, I I I introduce uh, ions coming uh, like uh, for because it's growing on a material metal met can metal on air it can be oxidized especially during the reaction process that you are doing the chemical wet processing so there are a lot of uh, things that we have considered uh, while developing the technology here and again I think we have a lot of things to optimize so the future of the graphene use is always related to something layer atomic layer certainly over a substrate, or it could be that it is uh, kind of an independent and uh, uh, by itself just a layer of that one atomic uh, thing. It's, it's a very good question. So right now, graphene is used in, uh, in different uh, ways. So the uh, one way it can be graphene flakes, like big flakes, not tiny flakes, can be uh, mixed with the, like solution like toluene. The flakes are already just film. There is no substrate. Yes, just flakes mixed with a toluene or any other material. And you can basically de depositing in, in uh, any other. Because it's toluene, it can be evaporated easily. And by the end, you can have this film of graphene. But again, you are sacrificing on optical properties. Because they're the like. Depending uh, what what processing are you making, the largest can be uh, micrometers uh, around 300, 400 micrometers, uh, completely depending on your processing conditions. Almost a millimeter. Yeah, it can be almost a millimeter. If it is that big, and if you be careful enough, you can have a material with good optical properties, good enough like tin, uh, indium tin oxide, cu currently available material for, for display, around 70-80% transparency, which is good enough to go. Again, depending what do you want to reach, but right now it's possible with the flakes. Uh, in other aspect, if you want just a conductive material, you can mix uh, like random flakes with another solution and basically just simply um, printed by 3D printer, for example. What has been the best use of graphene so far in a device or in some kind of application that is kind of changing something? So right now, the, my favorite, which is currently uh, right now on market, is Virgin um, Atlantic will be uh, using graphene as a protective layer on their Airbus. So that's like right now that has been done. And th this is like something I'm really passionate about. Because like you don't really need to have a very heavy aircraft. You can just like have this tiny layer of graphene covered uh, on the top of your make metal. Thinner? Yeah, and make it thinner and lighter and more How protected. Much? How much thinner? I'm not uh, sure because they just recently told that they're going to do that. The information is not public. But I really want to know how, how they're going to do that. But right now, it's uh, my favorite. So 
So the, they are going towards sports industry, so the making the rockets, you know, uh, for t tennis players, they are going towards like shoes. Uh, I think around five years it has been in commercial use, but not necessarily in electronics. So it hasn't been used in a full scale of its properties yet. Thank you. Uh, I think you had a question. Yes. Uh, you were talking about improvement of uh, vision. Yeah. Is it possible to make um, uh, the side of electromagnetic waves outside of this visible, I mean infrared or whatever, uh, is it possible to make it uh, visible? To create an artificial eye mm -hmm. with larger range of uh, electromagnetic waves using this thing? I am not entirely sure because we haven't had, uh, we haven't thought about that so far. Maybe it's possible, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure, sorry. Yes. Yes, in ideal case, yes. 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 A very good question. I, I will show you how we do that. Um, okay, so if we go to the transfer process, yeah. So we grow material, it's on the top of car, uh, copper and graphene on top. So the first thing what we do, we deposit polymer on top to make sure our graphene is completely secured. The next stage, what we do, we etch uh, the conductive material off with the ferrum chloride etching solution. And obviously, we choose exactly the chemicals the way, so it doesn't actually affect the polymer and graphene. And what we do, uh, the rest of the process, we have this old uh, di di diluting process. We wash the graphene, trying to uh, remove all the uh, ions left, all this uh, oxide, metal oxide left. And af after a couple of washing process, we are ending up having the material, which is uh, this very, uh, just like optical glass, and then graphene and the polymer on top. And what we do after this, we basically remove the top polymer and what we are ending up is just having this base material which is completely dielectric and the graphene on top. And this is the kind of substrate that we go uh, start uh, like developing our substrate. And it has to be open because we want the graphene to interact with liquid crystal. No, with, with this kind of method, it's not v vulnerable in terms of the processing, but obviously, if you scratch it and you touch it and dust particles, everything will affect. So everything is done in the clean rooms. So after you finish everything? It encapsulated. So graphene doesn't actually interact with air. Yes, please. You mentioned about the optical properties of graphene. Which outstanding properties uh, are uh, really interesting uh, ones. So the first one, because it's one atomic layer, it uh, has only 3% absorption. By adding up layers, we are ending up, and uh, when it is actually one atomic layer, the band structure is, is that, that it has points of like, the violence band and conduction band are almost overlapping, so it's kind of semi-metal. So in one side, it's kind of semi-metal, because it has um, two types of carriers, the conductivity is very high. So in one side, we have this very nice optical properties, 3% absorption. And in the uh, other hand, we have this interesting band structure. And because of this band structure, we have almost conductive uh, kind of metal material. Again, by adding layers, material becomes semiconductor because the band structure is changing. And optical properties is changing because every new layer adds up 3% of absorption. If you have many layers of graphene, that is the same as graphite. Yeah, but even in 7 to 10, it's, it's again the perfect material for electronics. Because 7 to 10 layers, from 7 to 10. It's a semiconductor, but again, very good properties. Around like 90% absorption. 
and with uh, properties um, uh, with conductivity it's still uh, much better than any other currently available it material like it kind of behaves like semiconductor but it's much better than silicon and tin the indium tin oxide and the band gap by uh, again is kind of becomes um, indirect band gap it kind of uh, the structure becomes similar to indirect band gap like kind of yes but uh, it's uh, much better than silicon it's near to gallium arsenide Amanda, yes you are for a while in uh, armenia Yerevan. do you see any uh, possibility for uh, collaboration between centers that exist here that are very good question. So I think around two years I've been collaborating with the Nanoscience Center at Yerevan State University. So um, obviously I brought graphene for them and we, uh, I, I, we learned together how to do the transfer and based on that they made devices and they had a very good result. So they have a couple of publications based on the structure that uh, 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 we uh, initially developed in Cambridge and then they kind of optimize it according to the properties because they are going toward optical uh, devices rather than electronics that we are interested in, so they optimize the structure but yeah we we have been collaborating with them and uh, that's the only uh, center so far that I have been working with yeah any other questions yes please Sure. Nano solar technologies, do they use this graphic? Or not? Uh, yes, uh, in some. Um, so, right now, the hybrid solar cells, they use so many different technologies. So, they use different mixtures of polymers, they use different quantum dots, they use graphene as a conductive layer, they use, all, uh, again, flexible uh, polymer, conductive polymers. So, depending uh, what they want to reach and uh, obviously every new research group is uh, proposing something slightly different so uh, in in my research group we did uh, we did made uh, graphene based solar panels but again my colleague was developing so I can only answer questions related with the electronics rather than the quantum dot and the solar uh, solar and uh, side Solar cells, tiny, tiny hybrid solar cells. Because commercially it is not available. No, uh, the, the highest we got was 80%, 8 percent, eight eight percent, which is like very very bad result for for the, the for the material. So, but we just started. So, by saying just like three years of research. So, so maybe it's a lot of room if, to grow. If there is a question, maybe the last one. Yes, yeah. please. So, um, how big of an, because as a materials engineer myself, mm -hmm. how big of an input has, does industry have in pushing research within this field? Um, do you think similar uh, inputs could be had in Armenia where industry could push materials engineering and material science mm -hmm. in Armenia, something similar mm -hmm. that happens in Europe, for instance? Uh, very good question. So in terms of graphene, right now industry is very, very impatient, pushing scientists to go to, in a commercial scale to producing something uh, like uh, the, or big organization like Samsung, LG uh, and a even Apple, they are pushing towards commercialization of uh, this kind of technology. But right now, I would say that we still have a lot of things to, uh, even, even if we kind of we prove the concept and it's possible to go towards the next stage of implementation. We need to see how it can be, uh, in, in ca it can be uh, functioned in a larger, like five to ten years. Because we, the, with the devices that I made, we played with the devices around three years. We don't know how it would behave in a long time, right? So I think we have a lot of things to consider and industry is very impatient, obviously, because they want innovative and new solutions to, to market. Okay. Yeah. So Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you.